Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 281 for Monday, November 23rd, 2020. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Yeah. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. You know, it's, um, I haven't had any gigs in a while, which I, I, I knew would happen and I expect will be the case for quite some time. But yeah, uh, yeah but you know, like that's, that's, I am... I knew it at the time and I know it now that I was very fortunate to be able to play what I played when the weather was warmer and things were not um, quite as bad as they have gotten again and, you know, all of that stuff. So, but it's okay. You know, I was thinking as you, as you talked us in t- episode 281, it is, it's pretty freaking cool. I don't think we've ever gone, we may have taken a week off here or there. Yeah. I don't think we've ever taken two weeks off, 281 conversations about playing music. That's, I think that's pretty cool. It, well, it, yeah, but to to that point, you know, the whole reason you came up with the idea of doing this is we probably had 281 conversations before that, right? So, <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> I mean, it, we we knew there was material here. It it was just a matter of organizing our time such that uh, such that we were we were doing it in a more official capacity. So absolutely, and you know, it, it's fun that we've made some connections. You know, we hear from musicians all over the world, you know, those buddies of ours who do cover band confidential. So they've got a, they've got a, a Facebook page and, you know, they do a, a video podcast, yeah. um, Adam and Dan. And first of all, Dan is a cool cat. That guy has got the best podcasting voice in the world. Doesn't he though? He, it's great. He reminds me of like seventies FM radio. Old and school FM. FM. Right? I, yeah. I, when we did that, I mean, I'd, I'd watched him and, and listened to him before, but when we did that episode with him, that crossover episode, which was their hundredth and um, that like, as soon as he, like, as soon as we were talking and in it here, I was like, man, that guy really does have like that. It's that old smoky kind of, you know, yeah. wolf man, like, you know, dulcet tones that relax you and soothe you. Uh, yeah, exactly. Without if you don't listen and to their Adam, show, go listen to their show. We'll put a link. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's and he's a cool cat too. So, you yeah. know, that, that's kind of fun. But Adam, you know, who is a really gifted vocalist. I mean, he's he did that darkness cover and I'm like, he hit those notes, man. And just confidently. And he's just a rock and roll kid. Oh, yeah. Anyway, he, uh, they did a episode, a brief episode. I think it's about 11 minutes long where they were referring one of our conversations about, about, you know, playing the hits, you know, playing the stuff that people like to see. And, you know, we, we've come and gone in this conversation many times over these 281 episodes, you know, but, it was kind of fun to watch Adam because it was a video podcast, the, the uh, you know a video event. Um, he was it was like the light bulb went on. He goes, "I'm going to try and do a show, and I'm just going to play the stuff that musicians all say. Hey, I've never done it before." He had no religion about it going into it. He just had never done it before. He you know he didn't right. say that he hated songs, and he so he was saying, "No, I I played Wagon Wheel twice over." He said, first of all, he said, "I played three hours straight for a number of reasons. One." it just kind of happened too. you know, when it dawned on me that I might have a break, uh, I might as well just keep going three. I was kind of curious where my chops were after not having, I had a lot of workouts over the last couple of times. So I just kind of did it. Net result of that was that the, the staff noticed that I really gave them a lot of effort. He goes, I I don't know that I would do it all every time, all the time, but it was, you know, an interesting study to see what the response was, but more interesting about this gig that he did. And he said it was kind of outside on a sidewalk, he said, I, I decided to play all those songs and really, you know, put together a set list and Neil Diamond stuff, Brown Eyed Girl, you know, that type of stuff. He goes, the tip register rang. I got a lot of tips. You know, the people who stayed, stayed and were into it and were ordering extra bottles of wine. And uh, the man, the owner of the, of the restaurant came over and said, hey, you're great. We should, we should do this more. And he was just kind of like talking through it. And, you know, he's a seasoned musician. This is not, you know, a guy who's not been around the block, but... He was like, you know, it makes sense. This is the stuff that people want. They recognize it. They like to do it. And, you know, it, it worked for everybody. And for me, I was thinking, you know, the the problem with a lot of musicians is you want, you gauge, 
you gauge people's reaction. Um, if you if you get your enjoyment from gauging people's reaction as a musician, yeah. you can see that this stuff is what works. And so, you know, it's like we've talked about so many times. It is kind of duh, you know. But I was thinking, it's true. Like, <laughs> my, my friends who are touring musicians, right? When they're not touring, they've got their wedding bands here in the Bay Area in California that get booked because they play the wedding band songs, right? They're not out there. So I, it was just kind of fun, and I, I recommend it because those guys are great. You can hear Dan's voice and kind of go off to dreamland, but you can also just kind of see what it, it's like when a light bulb, even for an experienced, you know, r- road-worn musician, kind of says, you know, why do I, wh- why do musicians hate this stuff? It makes the catch register ring. And, I, and, and actually, I, I do have one more reflection I'm going to lay on you and have you respond to it. But okay. I'm just kind of thinking that, you know, there is actually interesting room for both. I mean, if you want the tip jar to ring, that is the fastest path to it, right? If you want to get booked more, that is the probably as a cover musician, that is probably the fastest path to it. It does not mean that you can't um, that you can't play the stuff that moves you, even if it's you know, deep cuts or you know that type of thing. But there's a couple things that have to happen. One is you have to be crazy good. You have to sell the vibe of you know interpreting those other cover songs. Um, and so that's the first thing. You have to be you know crazy talented. And two, you have to have an audience that you know cares what you have to say. If you invest and you know you build an audience and you're entertaining and people like when they have their choice of what to do when they go out at night like oh that guy's playing it's always a good time when i see them yeah. you know and then i think the most clever uh, of people who are kind of cover artists who want to um who want to explore that space they pepper in a couple of them in intelligent ways and they use it as a connection point to further solidify their relationship with their audience. You, know, you play, you play wagon wheel and you, you know, you, you make a connection over that moment of sharing that songs. And like I've shared with you, I put together that, that show that's, you know, the great lost got a sing along yeah. Pack, packed house every time, you know, there was, there was nothing, even the musicians who are on stage playing the stuff that they've played a zillion times over the years. When you get a room full of people really into it, singing along that, it doesn't matter that, you know, that it's Mustang Sally. It doesn't matter. It's, 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 no, it's the, it's the you, moment, the experience of the moment. And, and, and like, I mean, this is what we were saying last week, I guess it was last week, two weeks ago, maybe uh, is think, don't think about what your, what song you have chosen. If that bothers you, if it doesn't, then absolutely think about it, but you know, find the thing that you can connect with in the moment that makes it exciting and that can be, I mean, it certainly can be the song. And if it is great, take it and run with it. But also it can be the crowd's reaction, you know, how much fun it is to play this one segment of that song, right? If something's a little tricky, okay, great. Like, you know, make it, find a thing that you can hang on to. And, and, you know, like we were saying, the easy one is the reaction and that, and which is if you're playing, if you're in an environment where it makes sense to be playing those songs, that is the point. Right. You know, you, you like to say, but you haven't seen my fastball yet. <laughs> but, but, but like often that's not the point is, you know, it's the point to just entertain. And if that's what it is, then just do that. You did. You said something where, you know, if if uh, that you need to be crazy talented to be able to pull off the the, uh, you know, the songs that are off the beaten path. And I think that's true. But I want to. I want to sort of add some context to that. You need to be crazy talented at delivering that specific song Mm -hmm. because I've, you know, there there are songs, you know, when I think back to, you know, fling playing and then we would pull out some tunes that always work that never had any reason to, to work. You know, a crowd doesn't know them, but we played the hell out of them. And, it, and yes, Fling is a talented band, but there's also songs that we would play that were off the beaten path that would die on the vine. And, it you know, we learned over time, like, this is the type of song that we're really good at delivering. And, you know, it's, it's yes, it's talent, but it's also the talent of knowing your strengths and and also being willing to, to realize you were wrong. Like, if you think, oh, this is going to kill, and you go out and you're like, oh, it actually killed the vibe. Like, <laughs> oh, different kind of kill. Different like, kill. <laughs> yeah, so take it off the list. You know, it's fine. But just, be, you know, being self-aware and, and figuring that out. But also, you know, the flip side of it is being self-aware that, oh, I can go take this relatively obscure tune that we really, really deliver well 
and own the crowd with it for no reason, you know, <laughs> like other than that we own the crowd with it and it's fine. Um, there's, I mean, there's a fish tune that, that fling plays uh, sample in a jar but it, among fish fans. Everybody knows the song beyond fish fans. Literally nobody knows the song, right? It's just not one of those tunes, which is fine. And our bass player brought it in and I was like, Oh yeah, I know that song, you know, but it, it just is the, it's a pretty straight ahead rocker and it works. And, and again, for the fling lineup, it fits. And I, like, I can't tell you how many times we've played that song and had, you know, the crowd just totally into it because the energy exchange just works for us with that song, but also have had club owners come up, you know, at the end of the night, man, what was that tune you played? Like that was, you guys are really good. And it's like, that's really funny. Like, <laughs> you know, they don't know that they never know the name of the song, right? Because they've never heard it before, but they're like, that song right. was great. And I was like, yeah, we play that well. And we identified that we play well. And Pretzel Logic from Steely Dan is another one that just works for Fling. And we crush it. And again, it's one of those songs. I mean, more, certainly more people know that than the fish tune. But um, but it's not the most popular of Steely Dan tunes, right? You, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of risky because it's that, you know, it's bordering on mid-tempo navel gazer type of stuff. And you got to be careful with those. But it doesn't matter. We crush it. And people by the end are like, you know, cheering us on. It's like, okay, great, cool. I'll, we'll take it. But, you know, again, not every song. <laughs> you kind of earn the right, you know, when you're a cover artist, you kind of earn the right to introduce those things by how, how well you give the people what they want. Yeah. Earns yeah. you, affords you the privilege to try and give them what you think they need. You know what I'm saying? I told, I, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, I do know what you're saying. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, you need to play the stuff that, you know, gets it done and buys your kind of trust, if you will. And that currency then can be used for you to do some artistic. And that's kind of the, you know, the cover artist journey, right? I yeah. mean, it, if you're going to do only, you know, deep cut tool covers, you know, <laughs> that's a, you know, you, if you, and again, if you can, if you can make an audience out of that, then you, then you can write your own ticket, but you know, to acquire an audience is you write tools to that stuff. But that's okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, but anyway, it was cool. I recommend everybody find that. They, he actually posted the video on on our Facebook page, so you can find it there or over at Cover Band Confidential. Again, they're great guys, and they do a good job. Similar to what we do, a little, little bit of a different style, you know, and again, two different perspectives on it. So yeah. I love those guys. It was fun to do that gig with them and um, that show with them. And, uh, you know, the more stuff out there that helps musicians crush, the better. The better. Yeah, well, and it's just fun to talk about this stuff for us. Like, and I'm, I'm, I don't mean just you and me, Paul. I mean, all of us that are listening here, like we appreciate the inside baseball of this. It's why this show Definitely. exists. It's the, you know, the conversations that would happen backstage, um, you know, that aren't necessarily entertaining to our music audiences. Although clearly there are some folks that listen who are part of that audience and that's even better, you know, but, but yeah, that's, um, well, I mean, think about it. You know, we are those types of guys, you know, maybe not on the same time schedule, but A, you play a gig, you've made a bunch of mental notes on a gig. Yeah. You may want to listen to the gig afterwards, you know, for further dissection, then type up your notes and reflections and, you know, show notes to share with your band. You go to social media and if your group has a presence on social media, you observe the comments about, but you know, the show on social media, if it's, if it's, if people go there, I mean, that is, it's those types of obsessives that I think we speak to more. I would think that that's, that, that is you. Yeah. We, and we'd love <laughs> to hear from you feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We really like, we, in fact, we've got a, a note from Kevin that we're going to read in a minute here and, and dissect and discuss. And we love it when you folks are interactive with us, it especially love it when you folks are sort of driving what the show, what each episode is about. No, it's fantastic. The next thing I want to do, though, is I want to tell you about our latest sponsor, which is Headspace at headspace.com slash gig gab. Life is stressful normally, right? 2020 changes that a little bit, maybe ups the ante a little bit. And having good stress relief that goes beyond quick fixes is a really helpful thing. And Headspace is here to help. I have been a Headspace user. Headspace is a meditation app. It assists you 
in getting your meditation done. It is great for people of all experience levels with meditation. If you're brand new to it, if you've never done it, Headspace will walk you through the process. It, it's super easy. And of course, if you've done meditation uh, before, it adds to that and really kind of gives you different directions to go with and keeps you engaged. Uh, you know, you can start with like a three minute SOS meditation, or you can do a three minute SOS meditation. Even if you've meditated before, again, there's no rules here. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps that's advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. And that's why they're your daily dose of mindfulness with all these guided meditations. Again, the app is super easy to use things like need help falling asleep. They've got a wind down session. If you, if you've got kids, you know, they have a morning meditation that you can do with them. And they're backed by 25 published studies on all the benefits of Headspace, 600,000 five-star reviews, and over 60 million downloads. So listen, you deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. If you go to headspace.com slash giggab, again, headspace.com slash giggab, you get a free one-month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. It's in the app, but you you got to go to the website to get this deal with the free month. So it's and it really is the best deal offered right now. So go to headspace.com slash giggab today. Check it out. That's your way of supporting the show because they know that we sent you and that's a good thing. Our thanks to you for using Headspace and at headspace.com slash giggab. And our thanks to Headspace for sponsoring this episode. Cool stuff for sure. Um, Absolutely. Thanks, Headspace. Yeah. All right, I want to uh, I want to take us to this this note from Kevin, which strikes a chord for me in so many different ways. Actually, a few. Different Kevin points. has been one of our uh, more more regular um, contributors, so he's got this awesome band up in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he sent us videos of them, and he writes us these long, thoughtful informative um, suggestions and anecdotes and stuff like that. So Kevin, Kevin gets, gets about five gold stars for the amount of contributions that he gives. Yeah, Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, it's great. Uh, all right. So Kevin starts uh, for a variety of reasons. Scheduling rehearsals this winter is not going to be easy. While we, the band have consensus on the COVID front in terms of rules for rehearsals, uh, because we haven't been rehearsing, people are filling up their time with other things and trying to get back to something regularly scheduled is not going to be easy. My solution is just to worry about scheduling the next rehearsal rather than try to schedule them all. Uh, so the first item at any given rehearsal is to come up with a day and time for the next one. But for the first time, he says, I tried using a Google form on a variety of things instead of having an email negotiation and it worked pretty well. If nothing else, he says, it highlighted what I expected, uh, but I thought you might still find the approach interesting to consider. So he showed us the question and the results. And he says, bear in mind, there are six of us in the group. And as you'll see, we had no real consensus, even though we used to be able to regularly schedule something uh, going back 15 years. He says, you know, but COVID changes things. He says, so, yeah. you know, the, the question, the way he did the, the surveys is based on your best information. Are there any days that are better for a regularly scheduled rehearsal January through April 2021? Assume it will be twice a month, similar to what we intended for spring 2020. I guess, you know, they have their twice month schedule. Please check anything that's an option and don't worry about being 100 percent accurate. And then the options were Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday evening, and then Saturday morning, afternoon, evening were his, um, were his things. And, you know, with six people in the band, Pretty much every answer had three and some had four. None had five or six. Right. So and and that's it's really hard um, doing this kind of thing. It's difficult. I, I, and I'm a, asking is hard. Asking is that's the problem. Asking is hard. It It's it's one of those things where. I'm not sure what the right way to do this is, but you need to get one time slot at which everyone can attend. Right. I mean, I, yeah. I know I'm saying the obvious, but, but I think it's good to start with that because having a majority that can make a time slot still is failure, right? It needs yeah. to be unanimous. And so by polling people, I mean, everybody has a, has, you know, everybody's, of the schedules and all of that are valid and their lives and all of that are make sense. 
And and everybody needs to be respectful of that. But the reality is somebody's going to need to bend and 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 you need to communicate that up front. Like, look, I'm going to try and find the spot where we have the most availability. And then, you know, in his case, if he's got four out of the six for a few slots, say, OK, we're narrowing it down to these four or these three slots of these three. Does anyone do any of the two of you that can't make it? And of course. Bear in mind, it might not be the same two for any slot, right? But do any of the two people who can't make each of these slots have something completely unmovable, right? Like, oh, I work Saturday mornings. You know, that's how I put food on the table for my family. So I cannot change that. You know, we that's that's off the list. And I, I feel like, as I'm saying this out loud, Paul, maybe the right way to ask is, are there any times here, instead of asking what does work, Ask what doesn't like, what do you have in your schedule that you could not move for any of these slots? And you might come up with, you know, a zero or a one on one of those and then yeah. grab that and go. Yeah. You know, my, my style over time with a 10 piece band has been more, I pick and choose my spots where I have to be kind of a heavy guy. Right. Yeah, of course. So, of course. so I will respect day job responsibilities and a couple of the guys in my band teach. And so they teach into the evenings. Mm. And so, you know, whatever evening we end up on is going to be, you know, is going to be a sacrifice for them because their, their day job is actually a night job. Right. Right. So, I mean, but I mean, if you think about it, we're not going to rehearse on weekends and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to rehearse Friday night, Saturday night or Sunday. And hopefully we're playing otherwise, you know, sure. that's, that is kind of family time. Yeah. We're not going to rehearse during the days during the week because, you know, most of the guys do have a day job of some kind. So, you know, you've kind of got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday evening. Right. And even for, Thursday for, is for your sketchy. band. Right. I mean, other bands have different things. Right. Yeah, maybe, I know, but I know I a lot of bands where Sunday afternoon is the rehearsal ah, time. There you go. That's just normal. You know, so I try to I, I, I this is one of those things where I kind of know what the guys schedules are. And so, you know, I, I kind of know when their day, I know what their pain points are after this amount of time. So I kind of push ahead and just yeah. say this and, and, uh, you know, if I get any extreme pushback from more than one, if it's one person, I say, Hey, you know, we got a hearse and, uh, and this is the things I'm asking you, you know, will you, will you move some stuff around? Can you juggle something? Yeah. 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 That And so, so sometimes as the leader, you do, you gotta be that heavy, you know, which is not fun. And again, I don't, I don't do that all the time. It extends out to, to gigs. You know, when I first started the man, we got a gig, I would ask everybody, can you make the gig? <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah. that proved to be a disaster. You know, that proved to be, you know, guys not taking gigs for, for, you know, not good reasons. And, and, you know, after a while, a while when the leverage came to me, because it was a working band, um, I tell people when they're in the band, you're, you know, you're expected to be available. Um, up, your time is yours from 30 days in, right? So sure. I haven't booked anything on the first of the month. You know, assume you know that the that the month is clear, that type of thing. So you have a 30 day internal window to take other things. But you know, the assumption here, because I can't juggle nine other guys, including Bill, ten other guys' schedules. This, this assumption is you're here and you want to work. And I only bring this up not to derail the conversation, but more like sometimes you have to be the heavy and just say, you know, we have to get this done. Right. It, it like, needs it, to happen. It, yeah. yeah. This has to happen. Yeah. We've even had guys, I, we've had guys quit the house rockers. One guy, sure, because he didn't want to rehearse. I, I've been, I've been on all sides of this. I've been the, you know, the, the band member, uh, I've been the band leader or in the leadership position that is, you know, that required or relevant for this. And I've also been in bands where there really is no leader and it's just, you know, somebody has a gig opportunity and it, you know, you throw it up. And what we have found in all of those scenarios is pretty much what you found some version of let me know when you're not available and then we will schedule around that. And, and, and the same applies for rehearsals. And, and again, you, you know, your band might be the kind of band where it's like, well, if you're not available too often, then we have to not have you play in right. this band, right? Like, you're, well, you're not first call. You're not first call, right? Yeah, because you're clearly not available to be first call in that, you know, right. in that scenario. But, but whatever it is, and and again, your you know your band 
is going to be different. You're going to, your band is going to be your band. So whatever it is, you know, we would just, we would build a calendar of some sort where everybody would say, okay, these are the dates we can't do, uh, or, or not, you know, again, however that negotiation happens. And then, you know, okay, if somebody hasn't put the date on this calendar, I am free to book that date. And I know that and barring at some emergency, like that gig's going to happen. I don't need to make six phone calls to check and make sure before I say yes to the gig, I can just look while I'm on the phone with the agent and say, good to go. So let's take the, let's take the gig. And the same, I have found true for rehearsals. I, um, I, I had a, uh, a business partner with a, a non-musical business years and years ago. And I, I, um, <laughs> I tried something once I, I dictated something in a staff meeting and, and said, okay, you know, this is how it's going to be akin to saying we are going to practice every Tuesday night from here on through eternity. And the staff was, you know, totally against it. And, and, and I mean, like railed again, like we shouldn't do this thing. That's, that's a permanent change to our, our thing. And it was, it was just a, a mess. And in my head, I'm like, this is so much better for us all. Like you, you should just trust me, but you know, it was a, mm. it was a failure early, early management failure. And my partner who had a little more experience than me, actually perhaps a lot more at that time, uh, took me aside afterwards. And he's like, what are you doing? And, and I'm like, I don't know. Like, why, why are they against this? He <laughs> says, Oh, they're against it because you told them it was permanent. Yeah. He, he said, no, humans don't work that way. I'm like, I do. Well, He's like, and well, musicians really don't work yeah, that way. Right. Exactly. And, and he said, oh, you do. He said, but you're like, you know, you're an entrepreneur. You understand that permanent isn't really permanent. No, you can't rely on anything. That's why you're an entrepreneur. You, you know, you do this. I'm like, okay. He said, next time, no matter what you're thinking about this change that you're implementing, tell them it's a two week experiment. And I'm like, oh, right. He's like, because here's the thing. If it's a terrible idea, somebody's going to tell you right out of the gate that this doesn't work. Right. And if it's, uh, you know, so you're not going to crater the business, at least not if someone else sees that it's going to crater things or cause a problem. And he's like, and the good news is after two weeks now changing back is the thing no one wants to do because now habits are settled. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's brilliant. So smart. Now, yeah, so smart. of course, when the government came out back in the spring and said, we only need to lock down for two weeks, I heard echoes of myself there and I knew what was happening. <laughs> so I warned my family. I'm like, um, you know, I, I've, I've done this. this movie. I've done this yeah. before. Let's plan for a little longer than two weeks. Uh, it turns out that that was correct. Uh, but, the, you know, the same works with rehearsals. I will often just say, OK, we're next rehearsal Tuesday night. Somebody has a problem with it. I will hear about it immediately. It, you know, meanwhile, I've I've cleared my schedule for Tuesday nights, you know, assuming there's no initial pushback. Then at the next rehearsal, you say, OK, uh, next Tuesday night again. That worked for everybody. Great. And you just sort of do that. And now suddenly Tuesday night becomes band rehearsal night. And the guy that needs to juggle something to make the first or second Tuesday night work, if it's juggleable, you will never know about it. It's yeah. just, it's a done thing. And you didn't have to be heavy handed. You just had to be less than clear about your long-term intentions. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the, that's life, really genius. Life is a manipulation. You know, we all manipulate each other. I, I don't, and I, I don't say that in a negative way. It's just, you know, we are always negotiating and it's okay. And so you just say, let's try this because you know, for the greater good, you have to have the whole band together. There, yeah. there is no, all right, well, that guy can't make it. It's fine. It's, it's really non-optimal if that guy can't make it. Like that's not. We did a um, show many shows ago amongst the 281 we've done. That was, uh, that was a largely about um, how the, translation of your of your day job management skills needs to be modified when approaching a you know cover band right yeah. and you know I, I think about you know the, the gig gab graduate school of, of cover band management studies here and you know it's really it is it is a thing to understand when things are black and white and how really much more of the time things are not black and white, but totally. manipulating both of those two to get a result, right? You know, ultimately, if the band doesn't rehearse, you're going to have a problem, right? You know, in, in, for most bands, if you don't, right. if you don't keep the shit moving forward, you know, for whatever it is, get tighter, get, get better material, get newer material, whatever it is, you know, your band will the ship not will sink. Be this is one of those sink. this is one of those things where for some weird problem of physics the, the ship only can stay afloat if it's moving right so if it yep. stops it sinks so think about it that way yep 
But I've had, I've had that guy in a band who just because you tell him we have to do it, whether it's a good idea or not, just because he feels like he's being told what to do, mm. he has to push back and say, you know, and it takes a real long time and a lot of energy and a lot of pain, you know, to kind of get to a result with a guy like that. You know, anyone like that? I'm, I might have been that guy once or twice in my life. Well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But, and, and but I've too. also like, I know that that is not the way to keep a gig. Uh, so. You know what the light bulb really went on for me is when we had Kenny Aaron off on the show. Because here's a guy who's one of the greatest drummers in the world. And he's talking about, you know, when Mellencamp calls, you say, yes, sir. And you do it. Right. He doesn't, you know, he's a working guy who wants to keep his calendar full. This is like, again, one of the greatest guys. And he's, he, he's a side man in a band and he gets it that someone else is the one selling tickets and paying his freight. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so, you know, but again, this goes off into this, how is your band organized? Is there one guy who clearly, you know, you got to defer to that guy. I, in, in my band, it's funny when I get, when I get pushback, one of the first reactions I have, and I've had to take a long time to kind of, you know, really hold it up in front of me is I'm like, why would you who wants to work, do anything to, to, to unmotivate the guy who's out there trying to get you work? <laughs> it's a good question to ask, it, it, you know, it, it, having admitted to being that difficult guy at times, and it's not an intentional thing. I'm a control freak. It's not an and, intentional thing. And, and so, you know, but I, I'm, I, I, I catch myself in those things like, wait, why am I pushing back? I'm pushing back because I can. OK, what's who am I benefiting by this? You know, am I am yeah. I showing that I can be in control? Well, yeah. But does is that a good thing in this scenario? No. So stop it, Dave. You know, but, it, it, you know, if you are that guy, it, it will Check it, yourself. You got to check yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Check yourself. That's it. You know, what is the goal? What are you trying to get to? If You, if, you know, and if you're that guy who. Uh, for your own sense of value, sense sense of self worth, needs to be someone who pro has to prove you're the smartest guy in the room, or the you know you know that that you need some deference from your bandmates in order to make you feel connected. You really got to hold it up to the light. I mean, you know, <laughs> the best bands are the ones that move together, together, right? Move forward together. Like the whole everybody's lifting up the ship and everybody's going forward. Those bands accomplish a lot of things. In that Eagles movie. Uh, there is, there are, there are several key moments that really stood out for me and I appreciate seeing every time I watch it, I'm talking about history of the Eagles. There's a moment where Joe Walsh, now Joe Walsh had his own brand name, his own pedigree, and certainly had proven himself long before the Eagles invited him to play with them. And yet when things needed to be rejiggered and the Eagles, Don, you know, the, the, the people who were running the Eagles, AKA mm -hmm. Don Henley and Glenn Fry. Uh, went to the other members and said, okay, we're putting the band back together, but here's how it's going to be. You know, the two of us are going to get more than the rest of you get, but it's because we've been out here pushing the brand and there's reasons for it. And it's going to be good for all of us. This is how we're going to be able to move forward. And Joe Walsh, Mr. Egotistical, you know, certainly deserving of the ego says, you know, when Glenn and Don say something I just follow it because it's good for the Eagles and that's what matters the most mm, is it's good for the story. Eagles. And I would, the first time I saw that, I was like, wait, he's not the guy that caused the friction. How is this? Po it's Joe Walsh. Like, how is this possible? But yeah. he, he, like you said, you learn to check yourself and he clearly like whether he would have been able to do this in the seventies or not different story. I don't know. I, I have no idea what he saw in that environment, but certainly, you know, 10 years ago when they were putting together this movie, that was the thing is he was like, yeah, it's better for the Eagles. So I, I go with it, even though yes, those guys are getting a better deal than, than me. You know what? The best deal is that the Eagles get to play. And so I'm willing to take it. It's fine. You know, when, when I did this, I think I, we did an episode on this. When I came to the band and said, listen, a couple of things going to change. I'm going to, I'm going to take a, I've never taken a cut before, but I'm going to start taking a cut only on, on corporate gigs, all the festivals and all that, and all the club stuff, no cut. Yeah. But when I go out and, you know, sell a fest, you know, and, and I certainly had one guy say, that's not right. I know what I'm worth. You shouldn't get more than me. And, and, and afterwards I don't, he didn't feel that way. But in the moment of being in a group presented with a change, and some people just don't like change, sure. B, something that kind of rings the bell that this is a, 
this feels like a self-worth thing. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that that every human being needs to do when you're part of something, right? You need to be keenly aware of what are those things that are getting your blood going, that's getting your agita going, that's making you feel this and hold it up to the light and just say, is that me because it's my own stuff and I got to check myself or is this really worth me, you know, going to the mat for and, you know, risking a lot of stuff. Sometimes it is worth going to the mat for. I mean, sometimes it it is totally. And you know what? It feels like it in the moment you examine it. You're like, yep, I'm, I definitely, I want to buckle down and, 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 you know, this is the hill I want to die on. And then but I will rem- but remind you that dying on that hill is one thing, but like one, one of the more useful tips we've had is remember discourse, disagreement doesn't have to be a fight to the death all the time. It does not. That's correct. So dying on the hill is, is, you know, you got to really think about whether you want to die on the hill. Yeah. You can that's make a fair point. point. You can argue your point. Yeah. 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 But, but, you know, that, that process of, you know, digging in on something, knowing that you may need to walk back on that in the end, that's difficult for some of us. And I, I raise my hand here and it's a, you know, it's a lesson I've had to learn throughout my life, not just music. It's in, in fact, far less with music, more about, you know, business and things like that. Like sometimes it's just, you know, you get a, it's a, it's a relationship. It's a compromise. It, it is a yeah. series of compromises, not just one compromise. It, it is, yep, yep. it is the greater good kind of thing. And, and it, and you will screw it up. I mean, if, if I am any indication, you know, you'll screw it up at times and then you learn, you're like, Oh, maybe this time. Okay. You know, how can I, how can I go and argue my position and yet still feel comfortable walking away from it if in the end that is apparently the best thing. Well, this is the thing. Do, I mean, right? you, every musician always has to have right at their disposal the feeling of how great it feels when everything's going good mm-hmm. and the feeling of, of, you know, how frustrating it is when things aren't going good. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you're feeling the, the latter of that more often than not, you're probably in the wrong band. But I would say for most people, if you're in a band, especially if it's been going for a long time, that feeling of how great it is when you're working and the band has fun and you know, you you're creatively satisfied that should carry the day nine out of 10 times. That's a good point. That's a good litmus test, right? If you're constantly frustrated, then that's a, that's a good, you know, be aware of that because yeah. either you need to change something about your approach to this particular project or, and well, I, I guess really that's the answer. You need to change something about your approach. Then it might be, not approaching that project anymore, or it might be something else. Right. And, and any right. of those is, is, is fine. I mean, I, I think I've told the story a few times about a band that I was in changed bass players. And I, I just, this guy played out of tune all the time. He didn't play in time. And I found myself getting to the gig and uh, setting up my monitors so that I couldn't hear him. And, you know, then one night it was like, you know, I helped put my kids to bed and then I went off to the gig and I was like, why am I leaving my family? Mm. You know, to go do this thing that I really don't want to do and I'm not enjoying. And it was like, so I stopped and I stopped doing it until it became enjoyable again. And that was OK. Everybody was fine with it because I didn't I didn't blow it all up. Like that was the best part about that was I knew yeah, by sure. then, you know, it's like, OK, I'm going to have a conversation with the band leader and explain it calmly. And and it was all fine in the end. It was, you know, it was all good. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. See, I knew that. A conversation about scheduling rehearsals would lead to some good little insights. <laughs> I hope they've led. I hope this has led to good little insights for all of you listening. So feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Tell us, it, did it, did it, did it not? Did it trigger some other thoughts? Do you have other questions, other feedback to share? That's why we, that's why we have, uh, have all these channels. We love to hear from you. So everybody loves to hear from you. It's not just us that you get to talk to when you send your stuff yeah, in. We, you're really, when we read it, it's going out to a worldwide audience yeah. of, of musicians. So it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's what I got for today, man. You got anything else? Well, I just want to wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving here in the States and, and you know, wherever you are internationally, just know that we, we give thanks for the ability to play music. We give thanks for our listeners to be able to have this kind of, you know, very cathartic conversations. And, you know, Dave, you're my buddy, you know, we've been pals for a long time. Those five, 10 minutes where we catch up on each other's life before we start a show mean the world to me. You are, I am thankful for you as being my friend. Well, I, I thanks for saying that, uh, at, at whatever level it's appropriate to say you're welcome. But I, I you know, <laughs> I, I feel equally as thankful. I look forward to that 
uh, as much as I look forward to the episodes, it's not, sometimes I look forward to that more, but I don't want to, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to isolate our listeners out. I don't want to make everybody feel unwelcome, <laughs> but yeah, I love doing this show with you. Thank you uh, for five years of this and, you know, many years before that of uh, just the, the constant support that we give to each other is awesome. It's awesome. Absolutely. So thank you. Yeah. Yep. So peace, health, and happiness to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving for all of us in the States and uh, more good stuff to come. More good stuff to come. That's how it's going to be. Yeah. It's, it can only get better from here. I, 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 While I you're carving that turkey. That. While you're carving the turkey, always be performing. Always. That's a great performance. Yeah. Performance opportunity. <laughs> uh, 